Welcome back, happened. everyone. <laughs> Welcome back to the Native Informant Podcast. This is our impromptu session yep. that we didn't plan for at all. Because unfortunately, one of the guests ha- was sent uh, a time slot that was in their timeline <laughs> in their time slot i mean in their time zone in their time zone yeah see i can't even like uh in their time zone and it left us being like okay what are we going to do with this hour because we're already here we're 15 minutes late we just got to figure it out so mm-hmm. here we are here we are here we are here with we are. me too everyone who is on camera <laughs> for those of you who think i'm talking to the ether this <laughs> is me too she's who, off camera off camera who her is, mic is on <laughs> exactly um so what did you say that you wanted to start with because oh i really wanted to start with the elephant in the room which is which is your video the getting video. taken down yes. on instagram and getting flagged as hate speech yes getting like flagged what's as happening i know how did that happen this is the world we're living in right now need to where a video that made certain feminists really upset and butthurt by what i said uh without proper context without actually questioning why i said what i said which i stand i said what i said and i meant what i meant so let me clarify for that for those who still want to do the whataboutisms and the ge- the vast generalizations and the ad hominem attacks this is my clarification I said that female friendships are the worst. And I stand by that because from my experience dealing with women, whether it is professionally, personally, familially, socioculturally, I see a pattern of behavior that is interwoven between the women that I have interacted with. This is not to rid me for any accountability. I, of course, have myself to blame for many of those situations. I have myself to blame for many of the circumstances that I put myself in. But that's what therapy and post-rationalization and clarification does. So I know what I brought into the table from my side. But what I noticed was a certain pattern of behavior where the women would resume the role of victimhood and then dig their toes into that narrative that would further entrench them in that victimhood in order to relinquish themselves from any kind of accountability. And so when you would ask me at the time, female friendships as chat about them, because of my experience, they are the worst at the current time, period, end of discussion. And what I found so laughable is that the women that were coming for me, they had no context and they had no care for that context to understand why I said what I said and why I meant what I meant and where it came from. Instead, they kept inserting their own anecdotes as being like, I've I've dealt with many women who have been amazing or I've never dealt with anyone who was problematic to me as a woman. Women are absolute saints. Congratulations. I'm so happy for you. I'm so happy that you have had amazing relationships with women. There are people on one end of the spectrum that do, and then there are people on one end of the spectrum that don't. And I think it's so funny to me, it's almost laughable, when women generally take that statement and say to themselves, because it didn't happen to me, then it didn't happen. Because I didn't experience it, it wasn't the case. I think where people took offense is because women have been the victims maybe Mm -hmm. in a lot of situations and women have been mistreated Mm -hmm. and rightfully within society do you think people got offended when you called them out on that i think women who was who sit so comfortably in victimhood or like to resume the role of the victim in any kind of argument or disagreement it could be for any reason are people that choose the easy way out of conversations when you take that easy way out you don't have any accountability. You resume no role in that two-way dynamic. You don't have to justify your actions to anyone. And you can deflect from the situation at hand. I just think as a woman and men, but I'll say this specifically for a woman, you have to hold yourself accountable for the actions that you take and the role that you play. And I think when I make a statement, I'm coming at it from my own personal experience and my own personal perspective. People can align with it or they cannot. It's up to them. It's at your own discretion. You can take that information and do what you will with it. Mm -hmm. But I think to say that my experience is inaccurate or has no basis for truth or doesn't align with your reality, welcome to life, honey. Not everything is conditioned to your perspective and your reality. That's just the way it is. The same way that I can't relate to your experience of being sunshine and roses, my experience is a little bit different. The The only difference is that I do not choose to play the role of the victim. You'll never see me cry crocodile tears about it. You'll never see me sitting there like wallowing in my misery. Ask anyone who knows me. Ask anyone who knows me. When there is a situation or a circumstance where they've done me wrong, they know exactly what they did. They know exactly what they did. They just need time to adjust to that because they know that I'm not going to come at it 
with emotion. I'm going to come at it from logic and rationale. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say logically and rationally, this happened. And people can come and say, that's not the right way to go about it. And when you're dealing with emotion, you have to come at it from emotion. No, babe, that's not how the, that's not how life works. Do you think that the people who got really offended weren't exactly self-aware? No, I think that the people that got offended have a very myopic view of their reality. And granted, it might be sunshine and roses for them, and that's great for them. But I think for them as women to come at another woman for having an unfavorable opinion or a displeasing experience or a, dare I say, negative encounter with another female specimen, I find is intellectually lazy, not based on their reality, and they need to reorient their gaze just a little bit and to make accusations and thoughts of me being misogynistic or having internalized misogyny. It's like, mm, take a look at yourself for a second because what you did is literally the definition of what I was discussing. That any opinion that doesn't ex exist or entrench itself underneath the umbrella of feminism is all of a sudden written off? No, honey. The same way you have toxic masculinity, you have toxic femininity. The same way that you have disagreements and spats and arguments and uncomfortable conversations with men, you have to hold women accountable to that too. And I don't believe in this idea of the blanket statement, women supporting women. No, I will support you because you're a decent human. I will not stand by you just because you're a woman. You could do some heinous acts. You could do something that is unbelievably riddled with lies and manipulation and deceit. And I'm going to stand by you just because you're a woman? No, honey, that's not how it works. And anyone who thinks that is a little bit delusional and needs to course correct. But how do you wish women received that video? It's not... It's, it's not my problem how women receive that video. What's funny is the people that came at it from a from from that sort of I guess from that victimy perspective, they want to have people that are going to reaffirm their reality or they want people that are going to say exactly how they think and feel because it agrees with their perspective of of womanhood for them. But that's not everyone. The thing that blows my mind was that it resulted in a suspension and a removal of said video for hate speech. Guys, calm down, relax. The world already has enough drama and garbage that we have to deal with. You want to say me saying that women can be unfortunate at times is now considered hate speech? Guys, chalas, we'll leave this conversation. Chalas. <laughs> Check yourself. Yeah, <laughs> before you wreck yourself and me in the process as well. But anyways, um, so yeah, questions and queries. Um living in my own bubble in my own world is that living in denial and how do you think people should let's say contribute to the world well i mean the classic tale is ignorance is bliss right yeah if you are ignorant to the world around you you are extremely blissful in your existence mm -hmm. you can push aside any level of discomfort and our body always wants to go back to homeostasis our brain always wants to reroute and create loopholes in the way that we process pain or grief or anger or frustration in ways that are going to self-soothe us, that's going to make us feel better. So if it means conjuring up your own reality, if it means pushing away people that actually can give you perspective and 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 truth and and things that are not rooted in manipulation or coercion, I think that yeah, of course people are going to go back to what they need to go back to. I mean, I had a friend, uh, no longer, we're no longer friends. And she and I have had countless conversations about the Israeli-Palestinian genocide way before October the 7th. And we had chatted about it from the perspective of the two-state solution. We had chatted about it in terms of our cultural belief systems. And I was always very supportive of what she believed and what she thought. And any kind of ideological sense that she had led with or perhaps kept hidden from other friends, I was very, like, very much in support of her belief system because that's her reality. Mm -hmm. And my intention is never to convince someone some other reality that doesn't mm -hmm. align with their belief system because that's a whole lot of deprogramming they have to do. There's a whole lot of unlearning that they have to go through mm -hmm. because clearly whatever they've experienced is systemic programming and systematic manipulation and normalization of certain belief systems mm -hmm. that I cannot I cannot compete with. Mm -hmm. But I think the way that we ended our friendship was because we do not believe the same thing when it comes to humanity and genocide. Like we fundamentally disagree. And if you don't align yourself with your humanity and your understanding towards what is right and what is wrong and what is just, then I have no business having someone like you in my life. Like we cannot further our friendship. Mm. And even till this day, 
this person is still entrenching themselves in victimhood, still taking on this role that they did nothing wrong, still trying to have this moral high ground into the conversation, because I hear it from other people, the mutuals that we, that we interact with. And it just blows my mind that clearly this collective psychosis that we're going through mm -hmm. is going to end friendships, relationships, uh, professional relationships with colleagues. It's going to happen. But if after a year you still believe what you believe and you still want to have this myopic, cushioned, curated, dare I say manicured way of looking at the world mm -hmm. that is rid of all the evil and you have no relationship to God, a true understanding of what is right, fundamentally right, and what is wrong, I'm sorry, there's like, there's nothing more I can say to you. There's really nothing, there's no relationship that we can foster beyond this point. And this is something that really like blows my mind. I find that conversations surrounding very like Zionistic ideologies is that you have to reroute your perspective to cushion their experience. They will never rewrite their perspective to cushion yours. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I find very bizarre mm -hmm. that, okay, I can have condemnation for certain things. I can call things out when they're right and when they're wrong. Mm -hmm. But with you, it's like, why do I have to internalize your experience as the point of departure in this conversation? It's very bizarre to me. It's it's really strange. It's very entitled. It speaks on a, on a privilege that I don't think that that person on the other end of this conversation would even realize. Mm -hmm. That if you're discussing something that exists outside of your wheelhouse of recognition and understanding, that sometimes people are going to have opinions that you don't like or you don't believe or you don't align yourself with. It doesn't mean it's wrong. And this is what I've noticed in a lot of debates that we see about certain experiences, whether it's the Israeli-Palestinian genocide. is like the person that is on the Palestinian side will always lead with logic and rationale and will reorient themselves to speak from the perspective of what the person is coming from on the opposing side. It's disgusting, I think. And I think that we are living at a time right now where people are just so comfortable sitting in those realities that they will not budge. And so, I don't know, that's my, my two cents. Yes, I think a lot of people who believe Zionistic ideologies are people mm. who have been socially conditioned, mm -hmm. who have been programmed to believe certain realities, have been really manipulated from birth, mm -hmm. from the very beginning of their existence into repeating and regurgitating a very specific narrative that has been normalized and embedded so deep in their psyche that it's very hard to pull out from, but it can happen. The question is whether that person is willing to listen to the other side of the fence, whether that person is willing to realize that their reality perhaps is not the true reality, whether it's them to be open and receptive. And it's so funny because it's people that I know like in the context of the West or in Western cultures, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they claim that we're close-minded. Think again, my friend, you are the one who is mm -hmm. close-minded. We are extremely open-minded. Sometimes we are too open-minded mm -hmm. to cushion your reality and to make you feel better and to lead you down the path of knowledge and understanding and wisdom and intellectual growth. Where is your open-mindedness that you speak so proudly of from your Western high horse? Where is the understanding to realities that exist outside of your house from your ivory tower? Like, mm -hmm. hello? Like, this is why I find it's that typical saying that we always hear, anything that is seen through an accusation is a confession. That's what it is. The more you accuse and accuse and accuse, it's just you confessing to your own mirror reflection. I think people who are so deeply rooted in mm -hmm. their belief system, especially people that I know or have known and no longer friends with, their reality is specifically curated to fit what is comfortable for them. Mm. They will gladly applaud for BLM and they will be silent about Palestine. They will gladly speak of feminism in the Western world, but there are nowhere to be found when it comes to the women and the children that are suffering in Palestine, in Lebanon, in Syria. Isn't that funny? Isn't that really interesting how there's selective mm. altruism, selective charity, selective memory? It's, mm -hmm. just, it's just fascinating to me. Hmm. How would you educate and enlighten another person who was slightly ill-informed? I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. I think I spent way too much time trying to push them in a general direction mm -hmm. just by simply existing and being friends with them and, and giving them an alternative perspective and guiding them down certain paths that might not align with their ideologies. But I'm done doing that, as should everybody else. We were handholding for so long on so many different issues issues and situations and circumstances, whether it's through the lens of Islam, whether it's through the lens of Arab culture, whether it's through the lens of general, you know, global South identity. We've been very clear about where we stand. We have not shaken our perspective. 
it's very binary. Mm -hmm. And your question is to say, how does one guide one down this specific path? There are way too many channels that they can do. There is no longer a need for sociocultural, sociopolitical handholding. It is not up to Arabs or Muslims mm. to coddle you through your own self-growth and self-actualization. It is not mm. our job to put you in a position where you can climb up the ranks to reach self-mastery and hopefully end up the other end enlightened and aware. That is your job. The world is literally your oyster. Mm -hmm. Pick up your phone, type into Google and search. But for me to be responsible to help somebody down a path that the entire world has put on their backs to help them through? No, honey, mm -hmm. you got to do a bit of work. This is ridiculous now. Whenever I speak about something, I will always speak about it from a position of logic, rationale, and usually statistical analysis and research to back up my claim. Very rarely will I speak anecdotally. And when I do, I will state that I'm speaking from my own experience, from my own understanding or what I believe. Mm -hmm. So for people to turn around and conflate factual evidence with anecdotal opinions, mm -hmm. I think is where a lot of the misconfusion and the misunderstanding can be formed. Mm -hmm. But it's not my responsibility to clarify to you what you have already internalized because you're already going to see something that I say from your own perspective. If I say something that triggers you, clearly it's coming from a specific place that is embedded in your fabric. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's part of mine. Right. You can come at it and put your two cents and, mm -hmm. and state your opinion and we can have a discussion about it. But you cannot negate what I say from your own logic and rationale and you cannot deny what I say is not true because if it's from my own experience it's from my own experience yeah. deal with it by the way just as a side note for those who are listening oh, to this podcast minutes. yeah we've got 15 minutes but yeah. just as a side note for those people who are listening we literally started and we have like 30 <laughs> 30 minutes to put your phone on silent it's buzzing I don't want to so have to do this I don't have so I do not want to have to do this in post and get rid of that sound um <laughs> You know what's funny? Um, I want to get into conversations probably about narcissism or narcissistic personality disorder. The reason why I want to get into it is because the videos that I've recently posted on my social media have addressed narcissism or being a victim of narcissistic abuse or understanding narcissism. Mm -hmm. And it's like people are lapping this up. They're like, me too. I completely understand this. I've been in this pers perspective in this position. This is what I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. Like I said before, there is a spectrum of narcissism. Everyone is on the spectrum of narcissism. There is a fundamental difference between narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder. Right. One is a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. One is like a character trait or an attribute or something that is part of your general personality makeup. When I speak of narcissistic people, mm -hmm. I say that they have narcissistic qualities or they have like a lick of narcissism in, in, in that respect. I cannot diagnose someone with narcissistic personality disorder. I do not have the qualifications to do so. And I think that people like to conflate the two, people who are narcissistic and people who have narcissistic personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Do I know people who have been diagnosed NPDs or have BPD or things? Yes. Do I know people who are narcissistic and have those qualities and that it comes out through frustration or argumentation? Yes. Mm. But I think when you're talking about narcissistic personality disorder, it's someone who has been diagnosed through a series of tests, et cetera, et cetera, has had a pattern of behavior and their experience creates a disorderly existence that they cannot function because it's having a disorderly effect on their livelihood. It is causing them to have an issue with the way that they exist. Now, narcissism has been thrown out as this sexy term. And I always say it's like this kind of like buzzword where it's like, oh, this person did this to me. It's because they're a narcissist. It's like, well, yeah, they might be. They might be. But I think to throw it out and claim a disorder without any kind of basis, basis I think, mm -hmm. is just, you know, just ill-informed and, and, and ridiculous. I mean, look, we could go on about this forever. And I think that this is going to be like literally the shortest how long will we talk for? It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be boiled down to about like 15 minutes, I guarantee. But it's the shortest uh, conversation as a reflection of this podcast talking about position, victimhood and whatnot. For all of you guys who are listening, please like and subscribe, <laughs> hit the notification <laughs> bell. And I guess we'll see you next time when we're not in an impromptu session. Impromptu session. Let's plan this next time. All right. Because I, I have a lot of things to pick your brain on. All right. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye.